Yeah, we finally linked up. Um, I appreciate it. How how'd the race go yesterday? It was good. It was fun. It was competitive. Um, I uh, I went about as hard as I could go without without having a significant chance of wrecking insanely. Uh, right. uh, but I was within two seconds of the pros, so I'm good. Nice. These guys have I been mean, doing it a lot longer than me. <laughs> so, um, I mean, is this something you're going to pursue or is this like a hobby or are you just kind of trying to figure it out? No, you know, I'm pursuing it just kind of on my own level. Like, uh, I am, there's a, a rally sprint series that's held in Texas four races a year. I'm okay. competing in that that's ARA sanctioned. So that's a professional rally. Nice. Um, and then it looks like there will be a razor series with, uh, an organization called tour Texas off-road enthusiasts, uh, that I'll be pursuing as well. So I w I was able to get a third place yesterday in the razor class. Nice. Um, it was a double header. So that, that counts as two thir first or third places for me. And we'll go in for points for the whole season. Uh, next race is April 22nd for that one. Oh, nice. That's really cool. Um, well, Hey, so I'm glad I got you on here. Cause I mean that you, I don't think people know, just how instrumental you've been with um you've, you've almost been kind of behind the scenes in um like helping the career field like helping and not only just the career field but like other agents other organizations but the tech p career field especially i mean you've been integral in um standing things up and giving money and um uh so, you know supporting people and not the thing i like the most about it is it's not just been uh the organization itself but like individual guys you've reached out to them and helped them and you know and however they needed it and uh, I just want to commend you for that. I mean, I don't think you get enough recognition for you know what you do for the for the career field. So up top, I wanted to say that right off the bat. Well, well, thank you. I mean, you know that throughout my entire career, I held you in in one of the highest regards. You know, you were the you were the top tier back in that day. <laughs> like, uh, and and you know, I always have said, I was incredibly lucky to have have you guys when I came in. You know, because when I came in was right as like the first rotations were ending um right so like the push of afghanistan your first guys were coming back so around by the time i had graduated tech school we started seeing our silver star recipients um and i really dug into those like i read yeah. every citation I, I i wanted to know who these people were because that gave me something to truly strive to be when i was a tech p um, and the, and, the, and the work that you guys were doing in the 17th back in that day, you know, it's never going to be matched again. Like we had this sweet spot and I don't know if a lot of people, you know, young coming in or even old, uh, understand, like we had the perfect recipe that I don't think will ever be reproduced when it came to the two wars that kicked off where the TACP career field was in the technology spectrum and the training spectrum and things of that nature. So like for us to ever go back to a time frame where you didn't have a lot of oversight, you didn't have armchair quarterbacking, utilizing right. UAVs, like those first four years of the wars were incredibly different than what people see now. For sure, for sure, yeah. Yeah, you're right. They, and we were all trying to figure it out. Like, like you said, there was a lot of not, it, everything was brand new and we were trying to figure out like how we were, the TTPs weren't there. I mean, heck, we weren't even calling each other JTACs at the, at the beginning of it. So, so speaking of, speaking of when you first came in, tell me, let's start there. Let's, let's start about like how, what it, you know, why you decided to join and then, uh, you know, take me through your first couple assignments and some deployments and, uh, and let me hear your story. Well, the, um, the story is pretty wild of just, finding out about tech P uh, I had enlisted for the two W zero X one career field, which is a munitions systems apprentice. So an ammo guy, bomb loader. Okay. Um, and I was going to F 15 strike Eagles, which, you know, kind of sounds cool. But at the time I was super kind of not satisfied with that. I, I had that in my head at 17 years old. Cause I, I had gone to basic at, at 17 my dad had gotten orders to Naples, Italy, and your options in Naples were very slim if you were above 18. Like you're not allowed to really have a job in the country as 
a military dependent. And oh, really? so like my only option was online college. And I was just like, that sounds awful. So <laughs> right. even though like looking back, it's like, wait, you turned down like four years of living in Italy, like <laughs> right. to, go, to go join the military and go to war. Well, mm, yeah, I guess I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, hindsight being what it is, you know, come on. Yeah. You know what? I think I made the right choice. Sure. So I, um, I actually like was kind of upset because I was very into, you know, the movie Navy SEALs. Uh, I was into Rambo and all that stuff. And I was like, you know, combat, combat, combat. What we thought combat was, you know, when you first going in, like right. you wanted, you obviously wanted to do something that was, that was front lines front line I, you know i kept saying that like i was really i just was really disappointed in the in the career choice once i got to basic because once i got around everybody and like there were guys that are like oh, i'm going to be a crew chief and crew chiefs are the best thing in the air force like they have this this weird thing is like we're the we're the best job in the air force and it's like okay yeah but that's still not that cool you're you're turning a wrench on a plane like that's it's kind of rad but not as cool as it can be yeah. so it's necessary. A, it's a necessary job. It's important, but <laughs> it's, it's not what you were looking for. No, but for us that like just have that violent and itch of wait a minute, I can go, I can go do violence. No, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> um, right. And so, at at first, they said th they came in like first at the end of the first week. Once we got our uniforms, we didn't have name tapes. We just had uniforms, mm -hmm. and they were like, uh, "Hey." There's a SEER briefing today. SEER is a career field that's in the Air Force that's not necessarily advertised uh, by recruiters. You can only get into that program through through basic training and stuff like that. Who wants to go to it? And we're like, well, well, what's SEER? And they and the and the TI, you know, the regular Air Force is horrible at explaining any of these things. So they're just like, right. oh, they uh they make sure pilots, you know, know how to survive and get back when they've been captured. So like honestly, like. The way that he put it, Seer almost sounded like search and rescue. Like, so yeah. you're like, wait, that sounds really fucking cool. So <laughs> I raise my hand and I have I have these two guys that are that are my you know, bunk to my left, to my right. I'm kind of like, it's a pact, like, hey, if I go do anything, you guys are coming too. Like, we're gonna go figure this out. <laughs> right, so we go into the Seer briefing, we're standing in the back. There's, you know, a couple hundred people in there because it's always based on the week that you're in basic training. And uh and they start talking and then when when they start they get to the point of oh hey we're non we're we're not really a deployable career field we're just instructors i like that switch <laughs> went off in my head where i was like yeah no i don't i don't want this and they say in the beginning of it hey if at any point you don't like this you can leave so i tap the guys i'm like hey let's go they said that they're not deploying like i want to deploy so let, let's roll and so they're like okay cool so they go with me we're searching for our flight around around the the training squadron and we're told oh they're in this classroom we get into the classroom they're all sitting down there's a chalkboard up front and uh we're like what's going on they like they said this is the tac p brief and we're like oh what's that and everybody's like i have no idea so we're just sitting in there for probably like five minutes like we had showed the three of us showed up late because we yeah, were yeah. in the seer briefing right right and then all of a sudden this this gigantic you know keg of a man walks <laughs> in it was it was Hayes okay um and he is wearing BDUs and he has the special forces arrowhead and I, I look back at this and like I I I get that it's like for show but like yeah. when I start thinking about it I'm like well that's wrong like because he was wearing the dress blues arrowhead on his oh. <laughs> on his right shoulder so it was the blue and oh, yeah, yeah. and gold it was a subdued. Yeah. yeah and then he had <laughs> he had all these schools on his chest you know that were all black army uh school badges right right <clears throat> and he was wearing his beret so he walked in wearing his beret didn't take it off yeah and he stands at this chalkboard and he's like who who here likes money and like everybody's kind of like looking around and one kid's like, well, I'd like money. And then everybody's like, oh, I guess I do. And he writes like $300 on the chalkboard. And then he's like, he looks around and he goes, who likes to skydive? And like two or three guys are like, oh, I like skydiving. And he writes 250 <laughs> on the board. 
he goes, who likes to scuba dive? And somebody like, oh, I guess I do. And he writes the, the number on the board. And then he draws a line and he adds it all up and he circles it and he puts that number uh, up in the right corner of the chalkboard. He goes, that's how much extra I get paid to do my job. And everyone's kind of like, oh, go on. Yeah, and then he, we're like, listening. He, he paints this scenario. It was an Iranian scenario, nonetheless, which is funny. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, weren't, we were not at war with Iraq at this point. We had only invaded Afghanistan, and that was it. Okay. So he's like, here I am sitting above an airfield. I'm looking at at a bunch of, at a, at a Zeus 23, four, that's a Russian surface to air artillery piece. And we're like, Oh man. And he's like, he's like, and I got a guy smoking a cigarette right next to that thing. And I, and I'm looking at him. And so I put my laser on him and I shoot him with the laser and I call an A-10 who's up overhead and that A-10 fires a Maverick and that Maverick drives right onto that cigarette where I put my laser and, and destroys that dude and, and the thing. And then he's like, and I've got a whole battalion of army guys behind me as we just assault the airfield. He's like, that's my job. And I went, what the <laughs> fuck? That's real? Yeah. Uh, so he's like, who wants to 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 try out for this and i'm like i could not get my hand higher <laughs> like my hand was touching the roof and i'm grabbing both my buddies to my left and my right i'm raising their hands this, this, yeah this, this kid named scott perry and tyler woodson and we'll get to tyler woodson later okay so i'm like we're going boys uh <laughs> so he we're the only ones from the flight though that gave a shit like, really every, everybody after that was, spiel after that yeah i know that presentation yeah, yeah. We're the only, well, like I said, that flight was full of a lot of people that were like, oh, crew chiefs are badass or security forces is cool. I'm going to be a dog handler and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, lame. Uh, <laughs> so, so he, we stay back. The rest of the flight leaves. This, this dude, Sergeant Hayes writes me this appointment slip, hands it to me. He's like, all right, in four days. You're going to give this to your TI and you're going to meet me at, at this track. You can ask your TI where it is. You guys can march over there. That's, that's the day that you got to do the, the PT test to, for us to assess uh, if you, you're even able to go. So huh. I'm like, okay. So at that time we were doing PT seven days a week in basic training, you know, back when it was still important. Yeah, um, yeah. So like he had given us the entry standards and you had to run the two mile in 1430 or less. Right. So the first day I, 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 I don't know if I had done a two mile to this point yet. So I didn't know my time. Sure. So the, at that time in basic training, the TIs would like do us in formation, like push ups and sit ups and all this bullshit. And then they would let us run the track, like run the track for fucking 30 minutes, guys. Cool. So, we go, I ask him to time me because I need to see. I run like a seven minute flat mile and like collapse because I was like sprinting. Like, oh, right, right. I just like, I gassed myself. And he was like, that was a good mile time, but you're fucking done, like, like spent. <laughs> so, like, the next day, I tried it again, like, time it. I slowed it down a little bit. I think I got a, a 15 minute or something like that. And then the third day, I hit the 1435. So I knew like, okay, that day that I go and do this PT test, I, I know exactly where I need to push and I can shave off that five seconds and, and, and I'll be good to go. Sure, um, sure. So morning comes, we flash the thing. And the TI is also like super intimidated by tack piece too. So he was like, oh man, that tack piece stuff is crazy. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what, I don't remember what his background was, but he kept talking it up. So we're like, oh, this is awesome. We're going to be right. Jason Bourne. Let's go. So uh, I show up out there. There's about 100, 100 kids like uh, because they go to every flight that's in that week of basic training and get the volunteers. And like a lot of flights were showing up with like 10, 15 people a piece that, that wow. all wanted to try. Whereas like ours, it was just us three. So we do the PT test and throughout the entire PT test. And then Sergeant Busan was there. That's where I met okay. Sergeant Busan, Sergeant Hayes. Yeah. We're doing the PT test. I keep raising like, like I am doing push-ups, And as Sergeant Hayes is next to me, I'm like, Sergeant Hayes, 
Sergeant Hayes, do we could use MP5s? And he's like, shut the fuck up, Taylor. Like, because we have the gray, the gray sweat. Sure, sure. And we had like tape <laughs> right. with their name on it. And, uh, and and then anytime I could squeeze another question, Sergeant Hayes, could I, do we get to do this? And he's like, dude, just shut up. Do your PT test. <laughs> and like, so we go to the run and on every lap, I'm asking a question. One of the questions was, is do we get a laser on our gun? <laughs> Like, and he's like, shut up, Taylor. <laughs> like, and, and, and we do the test. I, I get, I get below 1430. So I was nice. super excited. Um, they do, they did kind of like a smoke session for a little while. A bunch of dudes quit, like guys quit during the PT test. Like, like even at like push ups and sit ups, they were just like, ah, oh, yeah, this isn't for me. And then they'd get up and, and you'd be like, great, march back to your thing. And, uh, and then they do, yeah, they did like a smoke up after the PT test. Like, and again, you don't, you're not used to that then. Like, yeah. so they start like yelling and like bear crawl over here. And, and then again, like, like, and they, and they're saying the whole time, this is barely even scratching the surface of what you're going to experience at, at the schoolhouse and blah, blah, blah. And so like, yeah, a bunch of dudes quit during the bear crawl and like, they just, they just gave us this mini shark. Um, and then we're all done. Like I had 40 questions and he had to tell me to leave. And, yeah, yeah. and so he was like, Hey, on the end of the fifth week of basic training on this day, when you get back from warrior week, if you, if you, if we're, we're going to go back and look at all these numbers and we've got notes on everybody, we have three slots to tech school oh, for, this, my for this, for this group. And, and how many, uh, how many total, like, didn't quit. Like how many, how many, uh, I would to go? say there was probably like 60 that, that, that stayed around. Wow. It was a good amount. Yeah. There yeah. was a decent amount of people there. And I think that's why they did this, this smoke session too, was, was they were trying like, to weed some yeah, more we out. Need, we need to thin this. Well, they, I, and they were trying to, you could tell that they were like analyzing cause they would stand in different places and kind of like, look at who, who enjoyed this. Like, All right. and who was just like, absolutely like over it. Yeah. Yeah. So I keep the appointment slip, uh, which I still have, by the way, I, I nice. can actually get, I can get you a photo of it. Um, <laughs> and I taped it to the bottom of my security drawer. And okay. when we get back from warrior week on the day that Sergeant Hayes said that we would find out, I untaped it. And that's the end of basic training. Pretty much. You just have parade practice and then you're graduating. So the TI is very loose at that point. You just, just give a shit because you're done. Right. Um, so I walk in at, at six 30 in the morning. Cause we're about to go down for breakfast and I flash that appointment slip, the original one. And I was like, Hey, me and, uh, me and these guys got to go do that tech piece stuff. And he was like, yeah, whatever, dude, like whatever, Taylor, <laughs> like go like after breakfast, just go. Yeah, yeah. I was like, all right. So we get done with breakfast and we form up in th <laughs> three of us, like, yeah. and they both are like, what are we doing? And <laughs> That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> I was like, we're going to go find out if we made it into TAC P. So we march. They're like, yeah, but where are we going? And I was like, all I know is where the MPF is. We'll start there. So we march to the MPF and we sit on this bench. And because because we get there at about 730, the MPF doesn't open until eight. Mm -hmm. Eight o'clock, they open. We come in. There's an old woman receptionist in there. She's like, oh, what are you guys here for? I'm like, oh, we're here to see Sergeant Hayes from the TACP recruiting uh, office. And she's like, oh, okay, just have a seat. So we sit. We sit until like one o'clock. Oh, my God. And she is like, hey, if they still – like she finally like looks out. She's like – and and again, like my two guys are with me. Like what the f are we doing? Like what is <laughs> right. the plan here? Hey, yeah, I, yeah. Like, I don't know. We'll figure this out. And so – uh she's like well hey let me call him i was like oh, yeah call him and i'm looking at both of them like hey we're getting somewhere <laughs> so i hear her call him and he and he's like who she's like uh looks like a airman basic taylor and he goes taylor all right hang on i'll be down there in a minute <laughs> and so <clears throat> it's probably 15 minutes and he comes blowing through the glass doors all right and he's got a stack of papers in his hand and he goes what the fuck are you doing here? And I stand up and go to parade rest and I give him a reporting statement. And he's like, shut the fuck up. I was like, Sergeant Hayes, I needed to know if I made it into tack P like, this is all I want. This is, this is it. And he looks down at these papers and he goes, yeah, Taylor, you did. And he hands me cause it's a new uh, enlistment contract. 
Oh, right, right. That, that they that they've now voided the old one. Yeah, yeah. And he goes and he looks at Tyler and and uh, and Perry and he's like, "But you guys didn't." And then he stops, and he goes, "But now I don't have to find these guys. Come over here." <laughs> Let's. Oh. And he prints them new orders for Tappy Tech School. No way. I interrupted two unsuspecting souls entire future of their lives yeah or yeah you <laughs> <laughs> you kind of hooked those guys up by taking them along with you well and then tyler woodson retired from the 165th asos like two years ago and uh yeah, i believe yeah. I, I think he told me that he told that story at his retirement of like <laughs> i'm still only here because of that shady mother <laughs> yeah <laughs> What about the other guy? What he end, end up doing? Old Mister Perry had quite the schoolhouse run. Like he he got washed back due to a knee injury, so he didn't get to start with our flight. Like because okay. he, he hurt his knee playing football in front of the debt back when we just had the grass out front. Right, right. Uh, and so that like put him on a path of never getting through, you know. And he oh, he yeah. was a troublemaker too, so he got in trouble a lot. So he was on like permanent. He's one of those permanent CQ guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but Woodson graduated with me. We went to, we went to jump school together. We went to the 14th together. Nice. We did see her like, so him and I stayed together from, from the time, you know, we got this contract to, you know, our first duty station. I love that story, man. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable now. Like to think yeah. about like that I was that brave, like, Oh, and just... it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Cause you were gone all day pretty much. Yeah. And the T.I. was oh, like, yeah. well, oh, he didn't give a shit. He thought we were doing a fucking tack piece. Shit. And that's, sure, like, sure. that's that was the thing. We came back with our contracts all marching proud. And he was like, holy shit. Like the T.I. was actually fucking. He goes, he, he said this to me. He goes, he goes, if you make it through that school, you can come back here and break me off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. So then so you got so the 14th was your first assignment after yeah. tech school. OK, yep. so you went to tech school, jump. Did you get jump, uh, jump school and then right Sear? Out of yeah. So, so that was cool right because okay. we got to go to Sear with Jump Wing Zone. So that's yeah, that's yeah. cool guy status over there and berets. Sure. Yep. So that yep. was nice. From Sear, we 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 rolled into the 14th ASOS, and both Tyler Woodson and I were Alpha Flight, so okay. A Flight 14th. Who'd you um? Who'd you have in your flight? Who was your flight into IC and? and uh, all that? So at the time, it was Lee Blackwell. Okay. So Lee Blackwell returned that that was October of 2003. So he came home after the incident with Ray. Oh yeah. And I met him at the Christmas party like in my first meeting was I just became the brigade one chuck which Lee Blackwell was the brigade NCOIC. Yeah. So like he had this very shocking cold conversation with me like when we shake hands he just looked me right in the eyes and he's like you have huge shoes to fill and i was like oh fuck. <laughs> yeah i couldn't imagine what lee was going through at that point and then i can't imagine you having to to like 18 like, year old kid that was, yeah. yeah that was your first experience was meeting <laughs> oh man and, and, and yeah, that's going to be my boss. And, and yeah, to name people that were in that flight, then you, you had, um, Leahy was, was okay. there, nice. Alex Miller, Travis oh, Cruz, um, DeLorean Sheridan, Stefan Jorgensen, Clint Campbell, Josh Craig, uh, a lot of heavy hitters in that one, man. Uh, yeah, Michael you know. Garino, Matt Davis. What? <laughs> Jeez. like when you start an all-star team man that office like, yeah <laughs> how lucky it was for you to be in that office i mean just well, to be I mean, around those, those guys that, by by 2004 all those people were in there uh yeah, obviously yeah. like matt davis mike reno those guys all came later but yes almost Still, every yeah, single I mean. person kenneth earl was 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 in there with us uh yeah, you yeah. know who went to the two four finished yep. his whole career out of the two four alex miller went to the two four out of alpha flight um 14th asos you know uh delorean sheridan clint campbell stefan jorgensen and josh miller all cross trained to be combat controllers as well as josh craig and then tj gannell uh matt davis greeno 
Like this was wild. guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really crazy. So then, um, so you're at the 14th. When did you, when did you start deploying? Like, tell me about some deployments you went on. Uh, so my first trip, it, it sucked because, and I cannot remember why I was, I was talking about this. Oh, by the way, Brett Davidson was in that flight as well. And Brett okay. was the guy who put me through the entire IQT and CMR upgrade, like CMR status. Like he did my CMR check ride, everything like Brett. Brett kicked the living shit out of me, but it made me more than ready for that first deployment. So oh, good deal. The I I cannot remember what happened, but the flight deployed to Afghanistan and I didn't go. I don't remember if it was just there were only so many slots and they took the guys, or if I was on some other TDY and this came down because things were very fast then. I don't remember sure. why I didn't go on that trip. But so I came back from a TDY or something and everyone's gone from the flight. And, uh, I was like, well, I got to deploy. I got to deploy. I got to deploy. So I went over to group where, um, uh, Rockle and, uh, Muller were over okay. the group and yep. I started begging to, to get out. Like, can, can you guys get me? Can you, cause the 18th day SOG obviously is just on the other side of the base. Which sure. that's not the case for everybody else under the 18th day SOG, but it was for us. Right. So, so I rolled over, was talking to J Rod and, and, uh, Moeller and, um, Todd Gannon. Okay. And I think I it was know. actually Todd Gannon that I was begging, like, find me something, find me. So I need to fucking go. This was 2005. Like, right. so I had arrived October of 2003. Obviously it took me until May to get CMR because they were, they were very crucial with yeah, yeah. how they see a you back then. It was not a, it was not a pencil whip and it wasn't a quick process. Like you, you had to do it. So I got CMR in May of 04 and then the, the flight left and I was beg borrowing and stealing to get out the gate. And okay. I think Todd Gannon called me. He was like, Hey, I can get you out on a core rotation. Uh, in 2005, are you in? I was like, yeah, I'll take whatever I can get. Like, <laughs> Let me go. So I roll out uh, in 2005 to the 18th Airborne Corps, which was running the ba the theater of Iraq. That right. was at C Camp Victory, Iraq, or Camp Victory, Baghdad. So, so yeah, I roll in. I'm the core TACP or core ALO in the, the Joint Operations Center of, of the entire theater of, of Iraq. Right. This was fucking cool. Like, it's... <laughs> As lame as, as, as every TAC P thinks to hear, like you're in the core op center. Like I'm, I'm there in 2005 when shit was really going down. General yeah. Petraeus was, you know, three rows below me with general vines. Um, general vines was running the theater at the time. And it was crazy to like, just those first two weeks I'm taking in seeing how warfare works from the entire macro level. Oh, for and sure. And I'm working for essentially the BDC to help allocation and appointment with the chaos. Right. So I, I was tasked with updating our priority matrix, how we prioritized ASRs, airstrike requests. Man. I say that because people, some people listen and they don't know what the fuck we're talking about. When we're <laughs> for sure. Acronyms. Yeah. So, so what that did for me for the rest of my career, because this is what I would do every day that I got on shift, I would walk up to my desk and I would have 150 ASRs for three days from now. Oh my God. And I would look through and read the remarks section and go one, one, four, eight, nine, four, one, one, four. And then I would prioritize them, scan them in priority with their priority number on them and shift them back over to the chaos and go, <laughs> here's your, here's your supported, unsupported. <laughs> you were the guy that was like, for any, if you didn't get your error when you wanted it, you can, you were the guy to blame I, or you were the I, guy to thank if you did get it. But I had a matrix that told me how to do that. And sure, I sure. was looking for, well, you know, first off, it came it came down to what is the commander's guidance of priority? 
And right. there's two, there's two matrices within that. Number one is mission type or number one is location. Number two is mission type. So yeah. the commander at the battle update brief every day would reiterate his guidance every day. He would say, our mission focus today is Talifar. Okay. That's my number one. And, and they, and the commander updates his matrix for me. So I actually, it updates on my screen that says, Hey, Talifar's number one priority. Number two top priority is to crit. Number three priority is Baghdad. So like when I'm doing this, I'm looking at that, that three letter grouping, that KBG, yeah, Kilo yeah. Bravo Golf, or whatever it is for location first. So I would go okay. through and prioritize them via location. Then I would look through and go, okay, what's our mission type? And, you know, if you said armed overwatch, you go in the fucking maybe pile. If right. you say HVT cap kill capture raid, that's that's one. So right. it wasn't right. it wasn't incredibly difficult. But once you learn it, if I know what this guy that sits up here is doing when he prioritizes my 2007 deployment, I never had an ASR unapproved. Right. Because you know exactly what they're looking for. You know exactly what to put yeah. on the request. Yeah. I knew exactly yeah, yeah. what to do because I know what he's doing yeah, yeah. up there. Um, <laughs> right, right. That's a good point. I mean, a lot of guys like they they – they give the like the, the core halt hard time, the ASOC, all that stuff. But the, man, when you're in those entities, when you're in those organizations, you learn how the whole battlefield works. I mean, that's you, that's it, you're getting the exposed to everything. It made me everything so much point. better for years to oh, come. Oh yeah, I'm sure. It made me able. Yeah. I mean, I taught tax ags for four years at the schoolhouse. I was the only one oh, that did right. it. I was the only one that wanted to do it. People hear that name yeah. and they go fuck that, but <laughs> I lived it. So for me to be able yeah. to teach it to the kids, it was fun because I gave them practical value to it. Because I remember when yeah. I sat in the tax ags class, it was a giant mess of a fucking graph on the board that made no sense. But when right. I taught at the schoolhouse and we did tax ags, we did, we did the process of an ASR in class. And I physically, yeah. I physically sectioned the class out of the whole way that the AOC and everybody works and we'd go, okay, JTAC, send up your request. And he hand carries it over and we do this whole walkthrough. And I, I would teach them <laughs> how this works because I got to see it and it made it so much more valuable to understand that way. Oh, for sure. Plus you had like anecdotal information. Like you were like, I, this is exactly what I did. It's not like, well, this is what I hear they do, or this is doctrine. It's like, no, I did this well, when I was, when I, I was before. shaking the tree to everybody from my position on Merck saying like trying to stress the importance of pre-planned ASRs. And the reason was, is I, I directly would see more allocation for cast flow sorties because I also did that breakdown too. So every day the chaos would publish the, the cast sortie flow matrix. And then I would break that down for the, for the general, for, for the chops to go, Hey, we have X amount of aircraft airborne at, at every hour for 24 hours. Here's what they're doing. I, I, that's what I would have to brief. So I would hit our guys up that love to send immediates every time they needed cast. And I'd go, listen, if you, can, if you send me a pre-planned for three days out, every day, the same amount of time, that increases my number of ASRs per day, which, which ASRs per day turned into the chaos. When the chaos has more ASRs turned in per day, we get more aircraft. And I got guys to send probably 15 to 20% more ASRs. And it gave us three more sorties a day, like almost instantly. And I was like, see, see, we get more air if you guys plan this shit because they have more of a demand for it. Right, right. And I, I would say one of the, the most nerdy things that I fucking ever did, and this all was because I was, I was incredibly bored but I also was, was bored and obsessing with what we were doing. So, right. So, uh, we had a gigantic push in 2005, the summer out of, uh, Talifar and Rawa. We put this cop out in Rawa. And the problem was, is those guys in Talifar and the guys in Rawa were getting attacked a bunch, like constantly. They were in a tick, like every yeah. three, two to three hours. And my tick response for them was like averaging 40, 45 minutes. And I hated that because I either had to pull yeah. the constant air patrol from Mosul 
to fly over there. Or no, I'm sorry, it didn't exist then. This is this is this is where we fix it. I had to pull X cast from a cap that were somewhere else in the country and they'd have to fly there. Or I had to launch GCAS and put it in the air and, and hand them our one backup. Uh, well, right. I didn't, but the ASOC did. That was obviously their job. But I was looking at this picture constantly. And mm. uh, so there was a sortie that was flown 24-7 that bothered me a lot. It was predominantly flown by F-16s, Vipers, and it was pipeline security. And so... 24 hours a day, there was a pair of fighters just flying the major pipelines. So one night at like one o'clock in the morning, I'm bored as fuck and I pull up our misreps and I just start digging through them for this, for this mission. And I yeah. find that for six months, there were only two SIGAC reports, significant activity reports out of the pipeline sortie guys. Six months, one of which was, one of which was reacted by the army and they found nothing. So it was like, cool. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm telling, I have got a guard ALO next to me that was pulled for this, or he's not a guard ALO. He was a guard fighter pilot. He was pulled for this as okay. a, as an AEF bucket, like random, like someone told him you're deploying to go be an ALO. He's an F-16 guy. And I, I like walk over to him. I'm like, Hey, we could get rid of this pipeline security bullshit and we could put a cap over Mosul. That puts our ticks response time at Talafar at like 10 minutes and Rawa like 20, 18, 20 minutes. He goes, actually, yeah, it would. I was like, can I go <laughs> tell the general? He's like, good luck. So I walk down there and there are three, it's a, it's a, it's a four star, three star, two star, or like a three star, one star. And I'm like, mm -hmm. can I talk to you guys for a second? And they're like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Like I'm an E4 <laughs> and DCU is too big for me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, the one star was a Marine Chinook pilot. And he was like, what okay. do you got? And I just laid out what I had just figured out. And I, I like mouth vomited. I was like, sir, for six months, we've been flying 24 hours a day on pipeline security. And after six months, we've literally only saw two things happen and none of, none of it was, was even real. And he was like, are, are you serious? And I'm like, here it is. And like, <laughs> he's like bring your alo down you're like bring your guy down here so the major comes down he's like is this is this legit he's like yeah he's like well, what do you need from me i go i need you to call i need you to call the 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 chaos which is jedi and tell him we're gonna <laughs> nuke this mission and we're putting a cap over mosul and i explained why the cap over mosul would be awesome he goes that's it we're like and the major's like yeah so he calls and there's like some a lot of confusion and some arguing and and then the the four star at some point is like yes that's what i want i want a better tick response time up there and he's like chops wants it and they're like okay so like in a matter of like three days this pipeline security shit like went away and we put a cap over mosul and i was like yay nice and that's a good victory man well i mean i think how many people you helped out by well, doing that i, I mean even like save lives talking probably, to him on you know? Merck constantly they're like man I can't get aircraft for like 40 minutes. I'm like, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> that'd be so like, it'd feel so helpless. Like, because the, you're their guy, you're the guy that's trying to, you know, that needs to send those aircraft well, out there. Or Aki was their guy. He was upstairs. So Aki was, Aki oh, okay. was sitting at Warhawk the same time I was, or I was downstairs. Oh, as okay. Core tac P or core Ayla. Um, so that's awesome. So yeah, go so ahead. That, that situation got me like recognized from the 18th EA SOG. So they like, they gave me airman of the month or quarter. They like, like I, I got a decoration that talks about this, uh, that Q actually gave me the day that I ETS from the military. It was a, a deck a oh, no from 2005. And it was so important to me because it talks about the fact that like, I know she did that. Like I was in the worst position attack B could be in the core fucking jock. And I was like, well, right. how could I, how could I fix some shit? So I was very proud of that. Um, yeah, of course you should be. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. For real. So Colonel Shepro came in as the new 18th commander. And okay. I am, I am at the end of my tour. I'm supposed to be going home in maybe two weeks. And, okay. uh, he comes up to the desk as, cause we're night shift. So he comes up at about nine o'clock 
to like meet us because he just took over. And the 18th EA SOG commander is essentially the entire core ALO that is filtering commander's guidance out to everybody in the entire a a sock a a sauce and a sog complex inside the theater so like he's always right. in the jock doing meetings with the big wigs but so he was coming up to meet us and he was like airman taylor i've i've heard a lot about you i heard you did some really good things up in this seat he goes what could i do for you i go send me to the fucking shittiest place of this that, that this country has to offer <laughs> and he like goes wide yeah. he's like what I go, sir, I want to, I want to do a double. Keep me here. Send me forward. I cannot go back to the 14th ASOS sitting on camp victory in the core jock and look any of those guys in the eye. Like I have to get, I want to go to the worst f-ing place that this, that this country has to offer. He was like, <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. And like three days later, he's like, you're going to Mosul oh, in Jesus. 2005. Well, that was it. That was the place. Whee! <laughs> so i got you up got there got to i got the third asos was up there the 172nd striker uh-huh. brigade had just ripped out with 2-1 the guys from hawaii uh colonel carilla who was the commander okay. then who got shot in the femur while he was chasing a fucking uh a, a bad guy down like colonel carilla's legend status um yeah, but yeah. yeah that had that had all just went down right before i got there and then i got there and got put on a striker team with those guys and and it was it was a blast i was so glad that i i was yeah. so happy being up there because it was like <laughs> i finally could breathe that i was gonna go home with a real combat patch not the puking dragon sure sure <laughs> So, I mean, so tell me about that. Did I mean, was Mosul as crazy as, I mean, when I was in Mosul, it was bananas. I mean, it was just like, there was something going on every oh, yeah. day. And like, how, how was it for you we, over there? We were bait. That's what we were. Like, yeah. it was recon by fire every day. We're going to drive yep. around until somebody picks a fight or we'll pick a fight or we'll <laughs> fucking, <laughs> we'll, we'll sleep out there. It. Like, and that's what it was. Like, <laughs> right. we came out that gate. I, uh, my, my specific vehicle took three IEDs over the course of, of, of being there. Like one was a deep buried. It, it, it detonated premature. So it detonated about, uh, eight and a half, 10 feet in front of us and like blew all the yeah. bullshit. We took, we took a direct one that popped the front two of the striker tires and it like knocked my, almost knocked my helmet off. And I, I dropped my uh-huh. weapon when it when it blew up and my weapon fell on the butt sure. stock and and the barrel into my stomach and i was like so scared of roll oh of my god hot after that like because it didn't go <laughs> off and i was like oh my god oh, oh. um so then uh you so how long did you stay in mosul how long i was that, not, i did there? four i did so it was a four month aef i i um volunteered to do another four months so i did four four more okay. months in mosul um and got yes. got to do all kinds of different missions, whether it was striker dismount. I got to run around with an ODA uh, for like two months uh, because they were the only ones on on Merez, and they were like, "Wait, there's Tac P's here. Fucking come out with us." <laughs> right. Even though I wasn't, How'd I was not a JTAC. Um, but the the, the oh really oh yeah the JTAC right. yeah, yeah. that was with us was like, I don't want to go do that. And I was like kicking and screaming, you know, that's, you know how that's crazy to me. Yeah. Are. We're like, yeah, I'm for sorry, sure. What? You know, like, cause I came running back in because I was at the, I was at the yeah, shooting yeah. range. Uh, a couple of their, their guys came up and they kept looking at me really weird. And they finally walked over there. Like, what the f- are you? Because you have like 13 different pieces of uniform on because I had, I had yeah. brand new ACUs cause they had just switched. And like morel right. hiking boots, and then DCU uh, Arbav, like the old Arbav armor with with a tactical tailor rack over the top of it, and like oh, yeah, yeah. So he was like, "What? <laughs> Who are you?" I was like, "Oh, I'm a Tac P." But you're not army. And the guy's like, "What, dude? Follow me." So he takes me back to their compound, introduced me to their alpha. His name is Rob Gully, and. Uh, Rob was like, he looks at me and he just goes, we're going out in two hours. Will you be ready? I was like, <laughs> so I go, I go, Hey, I'm just a road Like that's, you know, it's like the assistant to the JTAC. I go, I'm going to go get him. Do you have two seats? He goes, yes, we on our hundred percent do. 
So I go running back down, blow the door open in, 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 in my chew. And I'm like to the JTAC, I just met the ODA. They want us to go out in two hours. We're going on a f-ing hit dude. And he's like, <laughs> looks at me sitting there playing PlayStation. He's like, I don't want to do that. I'm like, what? I'm like, well, can I go? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> and he, and he turns around and his 117 Fox is sitting on like over here and he turns the radio on. He goes, call me if you need anything and I'll just do it from here. I was like, okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, I mean, but I, I don't want to try to like, I'm not, I don't want to hit on anybody. Like we all are our own people and we all, you know, want to do different things. I know, I'm not saying, I'm not, like, say, guys like I'm not us. saying his name, but I also, the for last sure, I sure. heard of him is he went AWOL from, from a unit like 10 years ago. And I don't think anybody's seen him. So I don't think it's a big deal. Like, yeah, Oh really? Yeah. I don't, I don't know that this guy still exists because I heard he just kind of disappeared, but yeah, okay. he legitimately <laughs> like did not want this. He, he did not want to do this. And where I am That's so crazy. coming from the 14th, where now there's there's freaking glory in my eyes. It is like, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm going to go back now getting to support an ODA. Oh, yeah. it just got f-ing great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and another that's that's part that's definitely part of where I like that. But there's also another part of, you know, you the mission is there, so you do it. I mean, it's not like you know, you, it, it wasn't even a hesitation in your mind. In your if it had been, you know, Tenth uh, Mountain, you would have been like, oh, we're going out on a hit, let's do it, you know. Or what, I mean, it wasn't. I, I get just there are certain people that don't shy away from kind of opportunities like that, no, and, and you're you're this, one of this them. Was, sure. This was this was a this I would have begged. I would have been like, I'll man a gun. Yeah. I'll drive. I, I honestly, there were. There were probably 10 missions I drove for them, which I, nice. I, I was having a fucking blast. Like, right. Right. Yeah. So tell me about that. Tell me about some of the, like, what you got, what were you guys doing? Uh, so they had a partner force in town. Um, so we would always go to where their partner force was. Um, and then, and then they would get kind of an Intel dump from the like nip it or M T. I don't remember what it was called. There was an, there was a okay. crew there that lived with the partner force. We would show up. They would hand a fucking intel dump over and be like, okay, we're told that this guy's kidnapping people and holding them from ransom. And we're told this. And then the the commander and the, um, and the uh, team sergeant would go, okay, what do you want to action on first? And they'd go down. I mean, that was kind of the first, uh, the first experience to seeing how they, how they planned which was really cool. Yeah. Like, so one of the, one of the, the missions we did, which I remember like very detailed was this guy that supposedly was kidnapping people and selling that, like, like holding them for ransom and doing something like he would find out anybody that had worked with Americans or something. And he would, he would have them abducted and they would hold them in this holding area. So we had these like Intel cues and things. So like, I remember we, we get that, that Intel packet, or, or the dump, you know, the brief from their guy. And then he pulls yep. everybody in and he just goes around the room. He's like, he's like, Dennis, how would you do this? Like, cause we had the location that this guy is supposedly at. Then he's like, RV, yeah. how would you do this? Chris, how would you, he was there. It was their new guy on that trip. How would you do this? And, and takes input from everybody. He's like, all right. And then they, he's got like the map and a planning board and stuff like that. He's like, all right, here's what I think we do. And then he's like around the room again. Any of you guys see anything better? The warrant like chimes in with something like, "Hey, what if we, what if, what if, what if me and and this guy go in and uh, over in this area and just provide Overwatch with the sniper platforms and stuff like that?" It was really cool to watch. Like I watched yeah. adults be adults, like and go, "Hey, <laughs> right, all right. of us bring something to this fight. Show me." And then, yeah. and then they all came up with the best plan, and then we went and we executed it, and it was. Uh, we ended up pucking like two guys. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't know if we got the right guy. Like he, it turned out as we rolled in, he was getting a haircut from another dude. And like <laughs> we grabbed somebody and then on the way back, we found a IED. So we halted and, and our Charlie went out and did the whole, you know, getting rid of the IED thing, blowing it in place and stuff like that. And then we, 
we went home and I, I would get literally get off that and head straight to my crew who was at that time, I think they were like eating dinner or something. Then we were going on a night patrol with the strikers. So like, I was just like, Hey dude, anybody that wants to take me, I'll go and I'll do anything you want because yeah. this, this is why I'm here. And then there was one night hit we did that was a dry hole that, but I mean, that was crazy to, to experience like how, yeah. you know, I watched them roll in hot on a, on a target and roll through it and, they didn't find the guy they were looking for, so it sucked. And then we got back in and we took back off. Yeah. Did your um did the unit you were with give you any grief about going with those guys, or were they just like, eh, as long as it doesn't interfere with us? Or yeah. Like how, how I don't they really feel, they feel about I don't really know because I don't know what was filtered to me or not. Like I know oh, okay. later on, uh, Grindowski had mentioned it to me, and I think he was upset about it because he was up at brigade he's like i heard you've been going out with the oda guys i don't think you should be doing that and i was like don't take this away from me (laughs) yeah uh or i just you know lied i was like no i don't know what you're talking about i'll never do that again well i mean (laughs) what was his beef i mean like what what did he just he thought your priorities were should have been where you were or i don't i i I mean obviously you weren't sure i think i think it was torn because i wasn't extra they weren't short so like I was bouncing around three different tack teams. So there were three, yeah. there were three tack teams that were, one was with the Buffaloes, one was with, uh, four, one and four, two, three. And then, so like, I was always just an add on. So even when I was with the striker sure. crew, they had me on the, they had me on the two forty. like, and okay. occasionally I would, uh, I would like, brief aircraft on situation and stuff like that or i controlled a bunch of air weapons teams because we had a lot of uh of kiowa and apache crews like like we had the one kiowa at nap and the apache at 1200 so i talked to them a lot but again at the end of the day i was always just kind of warming them up for the jtacs and would pass them over there right but i was also always just this extra so i wasn't taking away from anybody and i was willing like I was more than willing. I would come back and I would do three, four missions a day. We would do a presence patrol with the, with the strikers in the morning. We'd come back for lunch. We'd do another afternoon one. Uh, we'd do an evening one. And then I would go out at night with, with the team. And, and and half the time too, I was just using the Rover for them. Like I was there to just provide another asset. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a JTAC per se, but I was there to be like, Hey, I have a Rover that I showed up with. That's mine. I'm not taking it from, right. from these guys. Do yeah, you yeah. want me to mount the antenna on the fucking Humvee and sit behind the commander? They're like, yes, you're a force multiplier at that point. I mean, if, why and not? again, like, I think you took, adva- <laughs> I think you did the right thing. I think you took advantage of your, you know, you being extra and like, you know, you, um, you know, you didn't shirk because that, that's a good opportunity for a guy that maybe not wasn't as motivated or didn't have the integrity you do to just kind of ch- skate, you know, and just kind of chill out and not really play video a games I mean, in a bunch of sandbagged fucking rooms. Like, right. But right. I selfishly wanted, I wanted to do it. Like, oh, yeah, I get to go sure. run around with a special forces team. Yes. And I just, yeah, I just you know, came I from core fucking joint operations center. Fuck off. Let's go. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, nah, man, I think you made the right decision. I think they had the right yeah, that was they put the right guy in the in the right position there. Um so then you do you have anything else you want to talk about as far as like that deployment? No, that or, was um, it was great. Was it was super cool. Up? You know, I got to see, you know, our JTAC got to conduct a decent amount of strikes, so I got I got to see the real sh- um yeah. and and it was it was just fun with experience. And then also like Yeah getting ingrained into kind of what the f- this whole thing was like it was why you know we did a, a number of med caps and we did you know kles or, or going through like tiny outskirt villages where we're like meeting people and seeing kids and kind of seeing like oh you know how like you kind of show up that first appointment like i'm gonna save everyone and then you start kind of realizing oh god what the fuck is going on here <laughs> like <laughs> yeah so that was really cool <laughs> and then and then i i came home to my flight coming back and they're like where were you oh dude i did all this they're like holy shit like 
what'd you guys do? Oh, we did all this. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's the best. The best is coming back and like, like brief back briefing everybody and kind of sharing yeah. stories and like, you know, just seeing what everybody was up to. And it's, so the then part. I jumped to, they, they pushed me through IQT, got a JTAC QC slot, got my eval. Um, I would say weeks after I got my eval, they activated DRF one, which I was on, which is DRB in the 82nd airborne. And they sent the three, two, five to Baghdad with like three days notice. It was like December 26th, 2006. We get the call. Hey, you're deploying. We were on the ground in, in Balad or, um, Taji by like January 3rd. <laughs> what was the deal? Like, what, was it just surge or were they, that was they, the kick, that was the kickoff specific? of the surge. Um, so okay. I was, I was lucky enough. I say lucky. Um, I was with second battalion of the three, two, five, the white Falcons. We moved into Baghdad in the Shab Ur area, which is about 800 yards from the border of Sadr city. So I, okay. s- I lived in a, in a burned out another fun building. place. Yeah. 800, 800 meters from solder. And yeah, they fucked with us every 90 minutes. Like you want to talk about people that have, that have taken incoming. Like we did every 90 minutes, like it was 60 millimeter mortars, RPGs. They hit us with 107 millimeter Katusha rockets. Like I had like 18 Katusha rockets hit my building after I got back in from a mission one night, I, I had just left the bathroom. I was in the stairwell. 18 rockets hits the side of our building. They had they had fashioned a bunch of uh, angle iron on a boat trailer and put all the rockets there on a time fuse and just shot them into the side of our building. It took um, it took somebody's legs. It, it screwed up somebody's eye, but I don't think I don't think that one killed anybody. Oh, man. Uh, but they did it. They did it. I mean, that's times. the worst. Like when you, I mean, you come back from a mission, you're already smoked. You're ready to hit the rack, and it's like you got to deal with that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's just keep that, and that's the kind of a. It's it illustrates how bad it is over there. I mean, you you, you there's never a break. It's never there's never really any downtime. Yeah, know? that was an incredibly odd um, deployment for my body, just because. Yeah, I was the I was the battalion JTAC, the only JTAC. I was the only guy with a rover, so that was a fight that happened with the army. They constantly wanted to f- and steal the rover, and the intel guys were like, "This is ours," and it was just a petty fight that I could have fixed now that I'm older and not a 22 year old f- idiot. <laughs> so yeah, tell me more about that. Tell me about the uh, that. I mean, what uh, the surge was there for a purpose, obviously. So what were you guys doing? <laughs> what kind of, kind of things were you guys up to? Uh, it was. I mean, we had our battle space and we just started, you know, living in it. We're during the day, we're meeting with mayors and giving them generators and water and shit like that. And then at night, we're going to hunt people they sell out for us. Um, it was, it was very busy. Like, uh, I was controlling a shit ton. I mean, like, all the time, whether it was UAVs or air weapons teams aircraft like we were we were in just like the busiest keypad that you could be in yeah. and if anything's going down i have to talk to the task force guys like because if they're inside solder city like we're we're sharing airspace so right, everything's right. gotta be like that that made me a really good jtac when it came to when it came to stacking it and and knowing where they were at at all times like yeah, because yeah. i had multiple get in the air at any given time and then at the same time too there was a rule uh that the division had put down that if any unit that goes into solder city has to have a jtac with them so there was um a striker brigade from washington state that was doing a bunch of 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 missions inside kind of the south portion of solder so every night like there were nights where again i would do missions with the 82nd guys or I'd come back and then the strikers would literally pull up outside my ECP while I'm standing on a curb in the middle of Baghdad. I would get in, <laughs> go out with them and I would come back. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was super busy. Like talk about lack of sleep just because there never was a schedule ever. Right. And myself and uh, this guy, Cody Cable was my one chuck for out there. 
we were we were out there for like three and a half four months solid before we ever came back and got to shower and like eat real food and shit like that so like it was pretty wild and then i ended that trip going over to the blue spaders 126 they flipped flopped jtax um that guy came to my place and i went to his place and uh that was a that was another very very weird situation because those guys had taken so many losses. And then in the first two weeks I was there, they lost an entire Bradley and crew. Jeez. And then, and then their, uh, their first Sergeant killed himself on a patrol, like three or four days later. And they're wait, like intentionally had, or like, yeah, in- like uh. on a patrol, put his rifle in his mouth. Like, Oh my God. It was, it was, and that was the thing. I'm now this brand new young kid that just showed up, even though I've been in country for like six, seven months Yeah. and the, and, and they don't know me. And then they're taking all these losses. Like it seemed like every single week. And I'm just like, Oh man, this is, this is nuts. Yeah. yeah because you're not, you, you don't, you have, you don't have the emotional rapport. investment that they yeah. do and the rapport. Yeah. But like they're they're all be, have felt all this, and you're like you're coming in from your missions. You're like I was, and I it's doing. very small too. Like it was a very small element. Like the talk element was, the the commander of that unit had to go home on a on a Red Cross because his son died from choking oh on God. a sandwich. So like, jeez, the XO had taken over as the CO, and they were trying to get a CO flown in from West Point, like and. It was just, it was a wild, wild, like two months. Yeah. Like, but I mean, did they even do anything or were they, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say shout out to my one Chuck there, Richard Lafayette. He was, he was the fucking glue that held us together. Like yeah. while we were there, that was a, that was a weird time. It was wild and, and rich could not have been a more solid fucking dude. I love that guy. Um, nice. and, and, and had a great, you know, a, a, a great addition to the team with him there. He was probably like that that conduit between the those guys and you that yeah. you know kind of like you know introduced you to him. Man, I can't imagine that. Is that why they switched out? Was it the J Tech just like oh, I got to get out of here, or was he just too stressed uh, out? Or? I I don't know. Uh, I think I think yeah. I think there were tensions with my battalion and me mm-hmm. uh, because they had they had gotten in um, a new thirteen Fox that had like just graduated AIT and he was flown. He he was like graduated AIT, signed into the unit, got put on a plane and shipped over to, to Baghdad. And like, now he's sitting at the desk next to me and this dude's 18 years old, brand new, doesn't know. And he had done a couple things that I intervened in and it pissed the fire support and COIC off. Um, because again, I'd been there for almost six months. I know these guys. You are a cherry little fuck fuck yeah, yeah. off. Right. And I was very, very close with Bravo Company of of that that battalion. And they were in a pretty nasty tick. And their fire support NCO, who I was very close with, this guy named Barton, he was on the mic controlling a five line with an Apache and dumb, dumb McGillicuddy over here is stepping on him, trying to ask for a sit rep. And so I unplug his fucking hand mic and throw it across the room. And I say, you don't step on your fucking guy that's in the middle of a control. And Jesus. he runs out crying. And then like <laughs> 10 minutes later, the fire support NCOIC comes running in, like screaming at how dare I fucking inter- touch any of their equipment or yell at their guy. And I, I'm like looking at the S3, like waiting for him to interject. Cause the S3 saw everything that happened. Yeah. And he like gave me the like head nod when I did that. Yeah. yeah. And so he was kind of on your side. Was he like, was on your side. He was like, no, this he is was legit. when it happened. Well then as I'm getting chewed out, he kind of just laughed because he's oh. like, he, he, I don't, I don't think he liked the air force. So who knows? But anyway, like I was just like straight faced with the guy. I was like, I don't care, man. Like he, it almost came to like shoving. Like, and I was like, I'll die on this hill all day long. Like yeah. your, your, your little cherry was stepping on Barton. And, and so no kidding. He like f- chews me out in front of the whole talk. And I just take it and I'm like, yeah, dude, I did the right thing. So I don't care. 
Right, right. A couple hours go by and those guys get back in and McElhaney, that, that kid is sitting over there like with a stupid grin on his face next to me like, haha, my dad just came in and yelled at you. Yeah. And, and, and the FSNCIC is sitting in there and Barton comes fucking barreling in covered in fucking dirt and and sweat and and all his shit's all fucked up because they were in this tech for a while yeah, yeah and he walks straight to the desk and he grabs that kid by his acus and gets right in his face he still has his helmet on and everything he's like you ever fucking do that to me again i will fucking kill you and he slams him down <laughs> and then i smile giantly <laughs> and just look around the whole talk and i look right at McElhaney and i'm like Yes. Yes. <laughs> what validation, man? That's perfect validation. That could have that could go on any better, well, man. Well then yeah, so that evening I had the debrief with the BCO OIC, the first sergeant, and and their fire support NCO, and I told them what I did. And then their fire support NCO went to the FS NCOIC and was like, Why the fuck were you yelling at him? He, yeah. that, that kid was fucking our shit up and he did what he needed to do. And then, yeah, he came and like half apologized to me and was like, but like, it still was a passive aggressive, like you still shouldn't touch our stuff. But after I talked to Barton, like you probably did the right thing probably, but who knows? <laughs> you still need to cut your hair. Fuck you. <laughs> you know what? That's good that enough. Kind of That's him. a good enough apology. <laughs> That coming from a guy like that, what all you're going to yeah, get anyways? So. I, I was, but also well, too, I'm not going to say that I was the pillar of professionalism in there. Like I was a fucking jackass too. Like, that's right. and that's why I, I, I know kidding, like would say this until I'm blue in the face. Like if we continue with it, with this career field, we need to put a fucking minimum age, age gate on it because just being above 25 and being in this position is going to change the way that you handle these situations. I was 22 sure. year, years old. I I was fucking making emotional moves like based on ego and bullshit like that and they were stupid. So I was busy fighting stupid fights. So when I actually got in a worthwhile fight, like it was blown out of proportion because people were sick of my shit. So it was like, okay, yeah. I really wish I could have, I could have deployed, go back and do those deployments again over 30 yeah. because yeah, that would have yeah. been a whole different level of lethality and, and cohesion than you would have saw when we were kids. For sure. Yeah. You get caught up in kind of minutia when you're that young and you don't see the big picture and it's hard to, it's hard to sift through what's important and what's not. Well, you and I talked about it. You, you brought up a good point <laughs> of making JTACs or somebody in our career field, or maybe the whole career field warrant officers. I mean, that was yeah. a. I thought that was a brilliant idea. I mean, that's a that's a perfect, you know, in between. You're not an O. You know, the officers can still be in charge, but they're you're not you're not this lower enlisted dude who an FSNCO may feel comfortable berating in front of the whole talk. You know, that if you're a warrant, you know, you could maybe have a little more ass behind you, I guess, or something. Well, it it makes sense in the aspect of you don't you don't go to 13 weeks of training and become a JTAC. Like it takes two to three years. Right. So why? The E4 rank does not re does not represent being trained in something for three years that right. you are now a certified position on that you have to take tech check rides on. No different than a pilot does. Yeah. So my position on that is we absolutely would earn that warrant status because we are an expert once we have been certified. That would change so many problems with with the way our career field reacts with the army. If you walk in as a chief. Even if you're a CW one, yeah, the army goes. I'm going to listen to this guy. Yep, that's true. Not yeah, that's good. Enforce. I force mean, a specialist to the army will never be of anything but cannon fodder. Right. Yeah, and you have to prove yourself like for a while before they even give you the time of day for sure. Every yeah. single time, too. Every time, and it's like yeah. when I'm walking into that talk in 2007, I already have a year of my life working with a higher echelon than this and then more capable teams than this. So it's right. like them judging me. It's like, no dude, I've already done this. Yeah. Like you, you're a new S3. You're a new S2. This is your first time. I've already been in this role. Like I know right, what right. I'm supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. I know. I know. It's uh, it's frustrating. And it's been that way since I came in. I mean, it's been that way since we've all, you know, we, since this 
that screw pill was in set, you know, um, <laughs> is you've always had to prove yourself. And they're like, who's this airman that's coming in here? It's like, no, no, he's not a, he's not an airman. He's not a private. He's a, isn't that like you said, like he's an expert. So you were, um, so when you de- redeployed back from that time, did you stay at the 14th for a little longer? Did, when did you, cause I know you went to Fort bliss too, didn't you? Yeah. So I came back from that trip. I was at the 14th for one more year. Then I got picked up to be an instructor at Herbert field. So oh, that's right. Okay. And yeah. Tell me about that. How was that taught from 2008 to 2012? It was Hawk seven, nine to Falcon nine, zero was the, the crew. And I taught block three, which is the last block, which was fun. Um, cast mission planning and execution tax ags, you know, all of our recce, um, and equipment bombs, all that stuff. It was, I, I had a blast teaching. I loved it. Um, but I didn't click into the mode of teaching those guys until probably two years in. Yeah. I was, I was way more in the mode of filtering out and, and making it hard rather than being there to show them what they needed to do to succeed and then test them on it. Okay. Like, and again, it came with age and maturity. Like you show up at a young age, like, especially all of us, we had just gotten back from back to back deployments. We're angry. And now it's our turn to kind of take it out on the, the kids, the way the instructors did it to us and sure. they and not necessarily like, and that, that's why I say it. it took a few years for me to finally go, I am here to teach these guys what I know and then evaluate them. Right. And if I'm not teaching them and they're not able to pass that evaluation, I'm failing explaining this. Yes. I'm going to have people that just won't get it because of their IQ, upbringing, ego, whatever it is, like they won't get it, but I need to focus on being a good teacher for these guys. Sure. Yeah. Weeding out the weeding out will happen on its own. Like if you, yes. the material will do it, what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, you, yeah, you don't need to put any extra effort into doing that. Yeah. That's a good point. And I'm sure that, I'm sure that last two years was just probably pretty rewarding seeing. How it was, many it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of fun. I really changed my attitude with those guys and I saw it come back. Like, yeah. Especially those last two years was when we started putting officers through. That was very important to me. I've always felt that we needed our own officers and we finally had our own blood going through. So I spent so much extra time with those guys nice. um, trying to teach them the the things that we needed out of them. And, right. uh, you know, I got some really good compliments from some really amazing people now, to, now that, have, that have achieved great things that said, hey, that class is one of the best classes I've been in in the military. I was like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, that's nice to hear. Again, that validation is nice. I mean, it's uh, it makes you feel like okay, I'm doing something. Yeah, I know that can be a crazy place down there. Did you have? Do you have anything that stands out that you were uh, any memories that were like, oh man, this happened this one time, or any students that were I, crazy? There's or... there's tons. Like yeah, uh... yeah, it's too much probably. <laughs> I know. Like it's, it's like, where do you start on that one? You always have wild student stories. You know, I I do say Hawk seven, nine was the hardest. If, if, if you are out there and you graduated Hawk seven, nine, I believe that that was the hardest, uh, tacky class to go through. We, we put them through so much like, and (laughs) if you made it through that team, like you, you definitely did it. What was, Uh, what was different about that? What was, what was they, I mean, this was when we just had no rules almost, uh, honestly. Like, we wouldn't even let them sleep in their barracks half the time. They had to sleep in a patrol base out by the PT field. <laughs> if they made us mad, like, you have to sleep in the patrol base. If you, like, the PT that we put them through was harder than anybody else's. Their uh, initial shark session was the the hardest I've ever seen we gone, we've we gone on a team. Um, they were missing a guy once, and we made him – we made him do stairs at the high school stadium until that guy showed up where we were at. So we left CQ, uh, a location when this guy came in looking for where his whole team was, (laughs) CQ was supposed to give him this note. And so they were climbing stairs from like midnight to eight, eight 30 in the morning. This kid had to run like three and a half miles to the high school from the base. Oh my God. Yeah. It was wild. And I think we calculated it out. Like they did like 76,000 stairs with their rucks on. Jeez. Cause we, we like counted cause they were doing the zigzag yeah. in the stadium and like we did the math and 
It was like, oh my god. He's was he just? Uh, what was he doing? I mean, where was he? He stayed the night at some girl's house. Uh, <coughs> and and nobody knew. No, he just bounced. So we punished the team until. <laughs> There's something to be said about that. That might have been a little extreme, but there is something to be said about having accountability of your guys. You know, like where's your teammates? You know, like everybody, everybody in there, didn't, nobody knew where this guy was. He could have been dead or whatever. So it's a good lesson. But it was fun. Like I had a great time. We got to do the memorials. You know, that's when we started the first reunion back up again. We had two really gnarly, awesome ones. And and then upon me leving, I just asked who wanted me, and Shropshire said, "I do. I want you to come to the seventh. And so nice. I base a preference to the seventh and that's how I ended up at Fort Bliss and uh, was just there for two years on active duty. Um, that was 2012 to 2014. Like the one problem I was, I started to see then was we were greatly lacking at our mid tier NCO experience level. We mm -hmm. had a ton of staffs and techs and even masters, but they were all like new three levels or brand new five levels. Like, I counted at one point at the seventh, there were only 10 of us that had been attacked P for over 10 years. So wow. it was like, dude, we need this. Where is all your experience at? We need this yeah, back yeah. because you're just not, you're just not getting, you know, the level of, of, of work out of the guys and training quality and things like that. When you're, when there's only 10 of you with the experience in the building. Sure. So then I had applied to palace chase cause I wanted to help recruiting uh, really bad for the battle then the battlefield airmen career fields and uh and i got hired by a e8 e9 promotable that that ran the whole west coast and he had created this position for me that was going to be really awesome and then three weeks or the two weeks before i ets he dies at his pt test no way. And he gets replaced by this active duty guy that's like just filling this job who then like tells me the day that I, I ETS'd that I need to report up there in Seattle like right now. And I was like, no, my report date was a month from now. My household goods don't even get picked up until, you know, two weeks from now. I'm like, this was already all planned. He goes, well, no, I'm in charge now. You need to be here tomorrow. And I go, let me guess. I'm no longer going to be the battlefield damage recruiter. I'm just going to be a normal recruiter. He goes, absolutely. I go, great. So I hung up. I called Lou Santiago from the 116th. And I was like, Lou, uh, enlist me in the guard. He was like, okay. So we got on Skype and I enlisted in the Washington state <laughs> national guard. Cause at that point I turned in my ID and I had ETS paperwork. Like I was okay. out. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was, and you hadn't done any to... kind of in processing for the guard or anything or. Nope. Okay. Perfect. So I get on Skype, raise my hand, the Colonel Gaikis and Lou Santiago, uh, enlist me into the United States national guard, the one sixteenth day sauce. <laughs> Homeboy oh calls me back like two hours later, like, did you get plane tickets? What time are you going to be here? I'm like, oh, I'm not coming. He's like, excuse me. I go, yeah, I actually enlisted in the guard about two hours ago with the 116th. So <laughs> if you want anything from me, go ahead and call Lou Santiago. And he's like, <laughs> what? I was like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> did you get any blowback from that at all? Or was it just like, hey, he's kind of out of his hands? No, Lou. I, I mean, I don't even think they bothered calling the one sixteenth because they yeah. knew the one sixteenth would be like, yeah, fuck off. Right, right. <laughs> let's, let's back up real quick because there's a piece of what you're doing now uh, is kind of started at the seventh, didn't it? Didn't your um, kind of entrepreneurship start at the seventh? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it started in Herbert Field, and that's when I had started doing a lot of graphics and photography for the tactical world. I met this guy Gary Stevens who currently our creative director at Black Rifle, him and I, he used to be part of AFSOC Graphics when that was a, a program. <clears throat> and uh, him and I started doing photography, graphics, and all this stuff on the side. I'm sure most of the people that have been around in the career field for a while know, like we were pumping out all kinds of weird, weird stuff. I mean, I actually spent a whole weekend digitizing, like officially digitizing the TACP crest and the soft TACP crest, which I'm sure you've seen many a time yeah. the 17th logo like i spent a whole weekend building that because it didn't exist oh really like, digitally yeah, yeah yeah 
nobody had like a high definition piece of artwork of it. So I had to make it. Huh. Um, I did that with our crest too and our flash. Like, so mm-hmm. yeah, back in like 2011, I, I had put all that stuff on a PDF that had all the high quality artwork and sent it out to all the chiefs that were like, Hey, here's all your art. So if you need nice. it for shirts or banners or PowerPoints and things like that, you have it. Nice. <laughs> and then when I moved to El Paso is when I, I met Matt, we started article 15 and that was a way to kind of expand what I had going once I had got there was beer drinking bomb droppers, which was just the, the tech P J tech kind of fun micro brand. Yeah. And, uh, Art 15 was a way to expand to all military and, and hit everybody that, that just thought, you know, being a little hoodlum or prankster was funny. All right. And then, then, you know, um, a year after meeting Matt, we meet Evan. We really pinned to Evan because we really liked him. Like this guy has great ideas. He has great work ethic. He has great education. Like this dude, we're going to find something to do with him. And then it took about eight months until Evan brought, the coffee idea in it was like i want to start this coffee company and we were like all right we're in so we just well wait where him. did where did you even come where'd you even meet evan like he isn't he like a, i don't really know evan's background that much but i thought he was like a soft dude or like an army yeah, guy he's right a, he's a green beret but he was uh contracting for the agency at the time he emailed matt while matt was deployed i had matt's inbox i looked at it i told matt he was like i think that guy works really high up in my program he's like this this might not be good i was like well here let me reach out to him and call him and I'll, I'll, I'll see if this is like bad or good. Okay. So I ended up, I ended up just calling him one day and we stayed on the phone for, for over an hour and we were laughing and having this great old time. And then I invited him out and he flew to Texas and we hung out in El Paso for, for a weekend. And then after that, it was just like, we were pinned Yeah. yeah. and it was instant and we didn't know what we were going to do. We just knew we were going to do something. Okay. And so, yeah, that was when he finally came to us and told us about coffee and then Black Rifle Coffee is born. And it, so all this happened when you're still in El Paso. Yeah. So where, now where did you, where'd you meet Matt? He messaged me on Facebook on a page okay. that I had and was just asking if I would share a video he made. And then uh, I was like, that. well, I could do so much more. I was like, you messaged the right person. Like, <laughs> how about you come out here, see the studio we do a whole production with you, like, like get, get graphics made, get a logo made, build your Facebook. And he was like, okay, this is crazy, but all right, I'll try it. And then he showed up and the rest is where you're at, nice. <laughs> where we're at now. Okay. Oh. So you, all this was started in El Paso. All this started when you were at Bliss and then you got out, you, you gave that guy, you tricked that dude and told him to F off. You went to the 116th. Now you moved up there, right? You were in no. that unit. No, you never I moved stayed, to the 116th. No. No, I stayed oh, you just, in El okay. Paso and then in 2016 moved to Salt Lake, which was a way shorter flight to Seattle. Sure, and sure. then I finally ETS'd out of the 116th uh, December of 2017. So that was okay. – and it was just – I couldn't give them time anymore and I didn't want my friends doing the work that I should be there sharing with them. Sure. And so I, I just was like, I got to hang it up, guys. I love you guys and I would stay here forever because we they talked about – Making me the first sergeant, which I thought would have been <laughs> fucking hilarious. That would have been funny. <laughs> that would have been funny. But uh, so you were just yeah. doing, you were just going because I forget. Yeah, that makes sense because then the guard, you can live anywhere you want. You just fly to the yeah. drill and then back. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. It was right. Yeah. Right on. We got so to then, do some uh, really cool exercises with those guys. Like they do a lot of joint stuff with coalition forces all the time. Like yeah. the Latvians and and Estonians. I got to run with some of the Kiwi SAS guys and the Australian SAS guys who I still keep in touch with now. Like, nice. dude, it was, it was so much fun. Like yeah, I could not be more of a champion for the guard because it was just a blast and I loved it. Yeah. Well, I was talking to Sharp about that uh, this last time a couple weeks ago and he, yeah, I mean, and Q of course, he's a very big proponent of the guard. I mean, that's a, that's a really cool, uh, option for you if you want to keep doing the job but you want to stay put or if you want to do some other stuff and plus like you said the um each, i think each guard unit has like a sister country that they mm-hmm. support or whatever and you guys have that <laughs> yeah but they all have like everybody this pair yeah yeah that's pretty cool that's a pretty cool function of that so then uh so then so you got out and so you had already been this the uh, the black rifle thing had already been pretty big before you got out so you're like yeah. this is 
you probably need to get out or well it was more of it was more of the guard was very lenient to me and i appreciated that but i don't necessarily want to take special favors like sure. they did put me on a special attendance agreement because again the guards saw the value that that i could bring from a recruiting aspect so there it was it was two things one it was yeah they would they would allow me to to go and skip a lot of drills and things like that but yeah. what that meant though is my friends my peers guys i went to tech school with that are that are the you know team sergeant or assistant team sergeant or whatever uh they're picking up and doing all the work but yeah. they're not necessarily in that because i'm holding a tech position in red team of the 116. So that yeah. means there's a guy that cannot slide into that slot, despite the fact that he's doing all the work for the team as that person, because I'm not there, he never gets the rank, the the money or the, the recognition, but he has to do everything. Yeah. And yeah. then at the same time, it's not like other people that have a state job or, you know, have another job that when they leave, things just go on. You're just not put on shift or things like that. Whereas me, when I left to go to drill, there's no replacement for me. So work doesn't stop. Yeah. yeah. So like it just wasn't working anymore right. from both of those aspects. So I was just like, you know, I had the conversation with Colonel Geikus, who's a great friend, amazing person that ended up retiring as the wing commander over there. And I was just like, I'm just going to have to go and Q supported it. Like yeah. he knew, he knew that I was conscious of, you know, being given a lot of leniency and I wanted to leave before that turned into animosity. Sure. Because sure. the last thing I wanted was people going, Oh, well, JT just gets to do whatever the f he wants. <laughs> right. And plus at that point, are you, were you really doing, did you really need to do it? I guess. I mean, yeah, no. it might've been fun to go, you know, hang out with some foreigners or like uh do some jumps or something but essentially you had already had this juggernaut of a company going so that that's that's probably you know that's a good way to shift out of that i didn't well. need it but i also did want to show that i still would do it like sure. for sure I, i'm not above it like right. i loved it so it was just yeah i i enjoyed my three years three years was enough and i think i left at the right time yeah well, oh, good. I'm glad that yeah, I'm glad there wasn't any animosity when you left. I mean, I'm glad you left on good terms. So tell me about we also talked about this before, but I want to hear more about it, about how the Tech P Association, because I, like I said, we like I said in the very beginning, you do a lot for the community. You do a lot for us. You do a lot for um, the association, the foundation. You do a lot for but you also do you do a lot for other career fields as well. But I was very interested in how you you were kind of integral in catapulting the tech P association into something more than it used to be. So do you, mind, you want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> well, you know, and you know, I, you see the, I saw the complaints the other day too. Again, they're, they're a dime a dozen. The whole, I joined the tech P association 30 years ago. Why do I have to join again? It's like when I took it over, I took it over in 2009. Um, I had, I, it was passed to me from uh, John Grusella. And he hadn't had it that long, but he had, he had given me the whole lowdown. He goes, Hey dude, data sheets are fucking everywhere. Like I have some like saved files and members over here. I have some over here. Like the organization of this historically has been kind of a mess. Like here's the account info. Here's the store, like go for it. And I was like, okay, so I took over the store and the association and the, okay. as the, pre, the, as the president of the association. And at the time, Brian Murray had just finished raising a lot of the money for the monument. Like uh, Brian was a very big part of that. Um, and, and I believe Charlie, Charlie helped out a lot with that too, was getting, getting that monument built so we could actually unveil our first thing that we had for ourselves. Sure. So we tackled the first uh reunion where we unveiled the monument we had the names put on put on the stone and and everybody came out and that was a really big deal that was a huge yeah, yeah. you know i got to MC it it was it was awesome we had a crazy cool party that <laughs> night of course uh, with a slip and slide and everything it was wild <laughs> um well then 
after that was kind of over, that's when I started like gears started turning and I was just like, Hey, like this thing isn't a nonprofit. It is a booster club on as part of the air force base and the air force has an AFI for booster clubs. And in that right. AFI, it says that we cannot maintain more than $6,000 on hand in the accounts. So I started kind of like, why isn't this a nonprofit? Why isn't this like, I started asking those questions and I called a lunch one day and I called because I always stay in touch with retirees. I always have like sure. those guys, like I hung out with them on regular basis like, because they were the people that brought me up. I loved being around them. So I called, um, and they're good dudes. I mean, frankly, they they're are. good guys. Good, good. I called Jason Zogelman. I called buddy MacArthur. I called Charlie Keeble. Um, Jason Wallace and Bowman. Yeah. Those were my five at the first, at the first lunch. And when those guys came out, I, they were like, well, I was like, we all need to talk. So I got them all together. We went to lunch <laughs> and I was like, I think you guys should be the association. I think it should be civilian ran. I think it's, it's, we have to create it as a nonprofit. And that's when Charlie was like, actually, you're right. Let me look into that. So Charlie like raised his hand and like Rogered up for, let me look into the fucking legal side of this in doing all this. And then we yeah. met, we met like once every three weeks for like a few months until like we had started building the TACP association, the official one. Yeah. And then we got, you know, Charlie was able to submit the paperwork, get it to be a, a, a C-19, a 501 C-19 uh, foundation and, and we were off and then no kidding. It must've been maybe less than two months had gone by and Brad Smith was killed. And so when Brad Smith was killed, uh, my, one of my best friends that I grew up with that became a TACP happened to be on casualty liaison for this. Like, so he called me like before he had notified Tiffany. And he said, Hey, because he knew, I knew Brad, you know, Brad was 14th with me. I ran him through CMR. Like I knew, I knew him and Tiffany pretty well. So Mm. I was like, well, Hey, do you want me to come up there? Like, cause now I have the TACP association. Like I can be there to, to, to start facility. He goes, yes, get up here. So me and uh, Colbert jumped in the car and while we're in the car, I'm calling the top three desks of every fighter squadron I can get. And I'm saying, Hey, we lost a JTAC. Can you guys donate? Here's the, here's the PayPal and the link. It's, it's, it's a nonprofit for the TACP association. They're like, absolutely. And by the time we got to Troy, Illinois, I want to say we had close to $75,000 that was put out. Like we had had the link online and then, like just physically calling. So like right away, as soon as I got up there, we were able to push Mike Malarcy's family, like 25 grand. And that was just to fly in friends and family that, that wanted to be there for him uh, being at Walter Reed that couldn't afford it or, you know, so it doesn't come out of their pocket. Sure. Um, and then we gave the rest to Tiffany for the same thing, kind of immediate needs type thing. Um, And, and then that was the first time there was a photo taken of the association at that point and put out that was like, Hey, the TACP association is on this, but it was, it was the team plus, um, Oh, Lunk. Okay. Okay. So, so, so yeah, Lunk had, had, while I was in Troy, Lunk had gathered all the officers and got them all together. And they were like, Hey, this is, this is the TACP association now. Like we're on it. And like that point forward, like everything changed. The association was no longer just that weird thing that you were leaving tech school and some guy asked you for 25 bucks to be a lifetime member. So that's where it's kind of like guys need to understand that this thing morphed into something real now. So 
this age old fucking bitch fest of, well, I joined in, in 97 and then it said it was a lifetime membership. It's like, that's great. But that thing doesn't exist anymore. Like right. a real thing exists. A real thing exists that has been really helping people since 2010. So yeah. get on board or, you know, right off. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's one way to put it. What I think, what I, the way I like about it is, yeah, we did, we did give back in the beginning, but that, like you said, that was just for like, you know, just, it was, it was a, like a shop at the tech school. It was like, you bought shirts and stickers, but now you know, that money that you're giving is no kidding. I mean, I, I have not been kept on as much as I should, but you may have, but like the Smith was not the only one. I mean, you guys, no. the tech Peace association gives money to a lot of people and they do a lot of things. And now, now it's, there's a tech P foundation that Tommy case is running. And then now it's like, you're, you know, we're giving courses to people that have, are getting out of the military. It's and, only getting better now and it's only oh, taking it's care of our guys. So it's like, right. yeah, it took, it took everybody. It took us a while to get this thing organized and rolling. And I'm not, on, I'm not part of the board. I'm not on it anymore, but I'm just saying like, like it's, it's morphed into something that is legitimate and real now. So like, we should all be very proud of that. Like, because sure. before it wasn't like before yeah. it was kind of a toss up and you know, we, we really didn't need it before, but the, the last freaking 13 years, we definitely needed it. The next yeah. 10 years, we're definitely going to need it. So yeah. get involved where you can and, and support it. Like they're, they're, they're doing good things. Yeah. It's a great cause. I mean, it like, it really helps. Yeah. I definitely want to mention that, but, uh, I also want to mention that, you know, not to be like, I know you know, we're peers, we're, we're buddies and everything, but I also, I, I, I hate, I wish there was a phrase you could say to somebody that's like your buddy that you could tell them you're proud of them without <laughs> being condescending. You know, like I always sound like, I'm proud of you, buddy. It's like, that sounds like kind of condescending, but man, you have, I want people to, the main reason I, I want people to see this is because I want people to understand that they can do what they want to do in life. Like they, they it's the sky's the limit. I mean, you are a perfect example of you and Evan and Matt. I mean, like you said, Evan had an idea and it, the, I, mean, I know Evan, I know you guys all probably went through a lot of stuff, but I read up a little bit on Evan about how he, um, uh, he sacrificed a lot to get this company off the ground. I mean, oh, yeah. it wasn't like, yeah, it wasn't he like, was, he, he was, was down he, to selling gear, like the last of his gear, like he yeah. was selling to fund some of, some of the, the raw coffee and things like that. So, and I mean, I also too, like he sacrificed his life like for this, like right. this is in, in all of us, like it, it is, be, it is morphed into our entire lives. Like, mm -hmm. and I mean, I, yeah, it's awesome. Like that. I, I, I am proud, but it's also very tiring. Like, Perfect. because also too, like I cannot go hang out with anybody anymore without getting approached or somebody wants to drag me into a conversation about, I, I want to put in a coffee shop or would you donate to this or would you do this? It's like, it's even, I can't remember, even when you were here, it's like, we go out somewhere, someone wants to pull me away and I don't even yeah, get to yeah. hang out with you. Like, and it's right, like, right. I can't be rude because that person is going to tell that story forever. Oh, I met that guy and he was a dick, but it's yeah. also too, like, man, I want my time too with the guys that like, and it's not, do you remember? Like, it's not new. Like I kept in routine touch with you forever. Like, yeah. I remember oh, when you sure. got the job at AFSOC as the functional and I called yeah. you like yelling, like, holy <laughs> shit, the AFSOC functional. <laughs> like, I remember driving through Harvard Field that day, like, as I was on the phone with you, like, yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about you taking oh, yeah. that position. Oh, yeah. We go way back, man. I remember we used to go to Crab <laughs> Island and hang out and, you know, and, you know, all that stuff. I mean, we, we were on the Romad, sure. like, we were on the Romad locator together. Like, like there was yeah. that crew back then. Like, right. It yeah, yeah just... I know. And that's why, and that's another thing. It's like people forget that like guys like, like guys like me who, you know, we see, we remember, you know, how you were before. And I, it's hard to imagine what you're going through right now, as far as like, like you said, if, I mean, you got to watch what you say, you got to watch what you do. I mean, people are always, you know, scrutinizing you for whatever you didn't do enough or you did too much or why'd you do it for this guy and not this guy. It's like, gee whiz, man. And give this guy, I just think they, they need to look at you as a person instead of like an, like an entity. Well, you know what I mean? And then it comes down to like who we actually were too. Like, you know, I was a E6 that was, was goofy and funny, but I also was good at what I did. And like, if you fucked up, like I'm not covering your ass, like you're going to learn from this mistake. Right. 
So when I have people that, you know, there are some pockets of people out there that want to sharpshoot what we do or want to question our service and stuff like that. It's like, okay, bitch, come on, let's go. Let's fight. Yeah. Like I've fought 10 dudes at once before. I used to do it all the time at the 14th. I'm not afraid. Like <laughs> <laughs> you got to head to at the 14th, you know, I know it was your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even like yeah, physical fighting, but even also like, uh, like online or people, are, you know, accusing. Well, you I just whatever, mean that, you know? that that's our mindset though. Like yeah, yeah. we came from a community that was like, dude, if you're running your mouth like that, like, Hey, step in, step in, let's go. Yeah. Like put your, put and, your money where your mouth is. And now, sure. but now I've had to adjust to this internet culture and it's been a hard adjustment because I have yeah. people that have no experience, no background, no achievements or accolades in anything like in warfare in, 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 in anything but they're going to tell me how it is like, or what right. courage means or what this means. And it's just like, no, dude, we need to go back to, you know, the, the internet has, has robbed us of you having to put your money where your mouth is, or you having yeah. to have experience before you start running your mouth. Like I, I right. sit there and I watch the kids and guys on Instagram that have taken, you know, one p pistol course in their life and they want to argue with a, a, a Delta operator of how it should be or what is, you know, my buddy that's a, that was a ranger medic for 13 years. Like he constantly is like, like having these, these people sharpshoot me his med trauma medicine when it's like, he has some of the most experience in trauma medicine on the planet, like in yeah. shit that you don't see all the time. Right. So it's just like, Oh, it's just weird. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird I, learning curve. It is. And wow. I think, like you said, I mean, it's so easy for people just to get on there and just say their little piece and they don't think much about it because they're behind their computer. But you know, they, people forget there's people, there are real people on the other end of these computers and they're like, you're a real person that your medic friend's a real person, you know, and they, they just forget that sometimes. And they, it's like, yeah, I got it. You have this one little aspect that you know about, but you don't know anything about this guy's background. And just, especially like a tag operator who's like, who has done been there, done that, I'm sure, you know, 10 times over and whatever, but well, man, uh, I don't take much more of your time. I know you're, you, I'm, I'm thanks for, you know, fitting me in and, uh, no, and, this was awesome. To, I love I, this I appreciate show. It. I'm <laughs> glad, I'm glad that, uh, people are going to hear about your background and, um, about what you've done. And it's, it's not just all, you know, JT on the Instagram or JT at Black Rifle. <laughs> it's like, no, this guy, he's, you've done the, you've done the work. You, you know, you've, uh, you're valid. So I want people to understand that. And I appreciate everything you're doing for, you know, the community and, and, uh, and, and everything, and not just ours, but like everybody's, I mean, people don't see that either about, you know, your kind of philanthropy and how you give back and give people a chance and like give, you know, uh, veterans a, a platform. And do you want, and I can cut this out if you don't want to talk about it. I don't, I definitely don't want to get into it, but I want, I definitely want people to know how you help individual people as well. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there who are struggling with mental health and uh, they don't, they aren't getting, it's either not available or they don't know where to find the help that they need. And you've been instrumental, not only in like just having a guy come to your house and talking about it or doing stuff, but also you're, you are a champion in Congress. You talk to congressmen, you talk to senators, you talk to government officials about veteran health, mental health. And I don't know if you want to go into that a little bit. I mean, I think well, that's, I mean, a, that's huge important. I think, you know, I, I, if, if, you have a lot of tech peas that listen to stuff like that. Yeah. If you haven't reached out to me and, and had a chat with me and you guys are, are, are having issues or you're trying to, to, to live a better life by, by all means, hit me up. You know, I communicate with everybody that, that hits me up and you know, I've just been running with a great crowd. I have to say that like it always comes back to the, we, not the, I like yeah. the, the Capones, Marcus and Amber Capone we're grateful enough to put me on the board of vets, the veterans experimenting treatment solutions. I've been working hand in hand with them for over two years now. They are championing all this stuff in Washington, DC, and I get to be a part of it. And I'm, I love that. And yes, you know, anytime I can get in front of somebody that has influence that, that can help us change, uh, the way that we, that we, foster and and procure care for our guys that just spent 20 20 years in a war and that whole war machine switch needs to switch off like i do everything i can to to help that um so yeah i mean thank you very much but also too like this is you guys are my guys like yeah. that's the whole thing i've always been been that dude that was that was hey it's all about us right so right 
it's it's I I see it as 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 no different as if if I lifted you up the obstacle course wall, you turn around and you grab your hand down. So I see this exactly. as you guys all lifted me up to that wall. So I have to be right here with my hand. Like that's, that's the way we way do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great way to look at it. <laughs> but this is, okay. this is, this is yeah. one of my favorite shows, man, because it's, I mean, geez, I get to do something with you uh, in the podcast realm after I've been around with you in our careers, like for, for over 18 years, like this is, yeah. this is a cool crossover for me. Well, I appreciate the feedback too. I mean, I appreciate the help. I mean, you, like when I came down to visit, you gave me a lot of good pointers and I, I appreciate that. Um, but no, I can't thank you enough for doing this, man. I know you're a busy dude and we've been trying to do it for a while and you lost some power and you had a race and you guys, yeah. I mean, you're just, your life is such a, yeah, that I, that I, one I, day that friend. we were scheduled to do it, we had zero power. That <laughs> that was funny. That was when that like Central Texas got yeah, a bunch of ice or something, and yeah, yeah. My brother was in the same boat. I think I think Kenny and you know all those guys were trying to suffer from it. But I can't thank you enough. I'm glad we got it done. Um, it's good, really good to talk to you again and uh, and get your background. And because I hadn't heard a lot of the stories about your about the military stuff, so I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I loved it. I love it. All right, man. Well. well um, I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we'll keep, I'll, I'll just text you something stupid here in a minute. Awesome. And, uh, I'll send you a bunch of photos. too. Yeah, for sure. All right, brother. <laughs> Bye, brother. All right. See ya.